Good morning. Welcome to Dover First Christian Church. Welcome to those of you watching online at home. Good to have you with us this morning, uh, worshiping from home. Good to have you here in the building, worshiping with us in person. Uh, that last video was from Round Lake Christian Camp. Over the last several weeks, we've been sharing just some clips of the different ministries and missions we support uh, with our Faith Promise. Next Sunday is going to be our Faith Promise Sunday, an opportunity for us to commit and pledge to give to these missions. We've talked about fame and arm and uh, TTM, and we'll have another video next week. But just all of these great places where the gospel is spread here locally. Uh, of course, Round Lake is near and dear to my heart. I spent hours and hours and hours of my life there, uh, but we support some great missions here. I ask that you kind of prayerfully consider uh, Faith Promise next week and, and making a pledge for 2021. Um, we're going to start a new series today. Uh, we are going to kind of plow through the Great Commission over the next four weeks. The Great Commission is found in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we're going to start in verse 16 and go through verse 20. Uh, if you want to turn there, we'll be there in just a few minutes. <clears throat> it is Jesus' parting words to his disciples. And so I thought for us to kind of truly understand and wrap our brain around what's going on there, uh, it's good for us to kind of understand the context in which the disciples might have heard these words for the first time. you got to think, for the last three months of their lives leading up to the Great Commission, they have just been through a whirlwind of change and ups and downs. So they begin this march from Galilee to Jerusalem, and all the Gospels record this progression where Jesus has been doing most of his ministry in Galilee, and he begins to move towards Jerusalem for the Passover. And on that journey, some of the most incredible things begin to happen. I mean, they've seen him heal people before, but they seem to happen around every corner in every town now. We get the incredible story with Zacchaeus, where Jesus is eating with Zacchaeus and offers him forgiveness and grace. We see blind men get their sight back, cripple men get up and walk. And most amazingly of all, they show up in Bethany at their friend Lazarus' house, and they come for calling hours, because Lazarus is dead. And instead of calling hours, they end up having a celebration, because Lazarus, who was dead and buried for four days, gets up and walks out of the tomb. That, of course, leads to the triumphal entry. When Jesus finally makes his entry into Jerusalem, the people have lined the streets, and they're chanting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you're one of the 12 disciples at that moment, as they're chanting Hosanna, as you're marching into the city, Lazarus is back from the dead, you're thinking one thing and one thing only, this is it. This is the moment when Jesus brings in his kingdom. This is the moment when all of those promises come true. This is those moment, the moment when God's kingdom comes here, when our enemies are defeated. It's finally happening. And then in the span of a few hours, Jesus is betrayed. He is arrested, he is tried and found guilty, he is beaten, he is crucified, and he is buried. And with him, their hope is buried, and their joy is buried, and their expectations are buried. How could they possibly go on from this? Jesus is dead. And just as quickly as their hope is gone, it comes back. There's Jesus in the upper room with them. There's Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus with them. There's Jesus uh, appearing to, to hundreds of followers. There's Jesus beside the Sea of Galilee eating fish with them. And so by the time we get to Matthew 28, they're on this mountaintop. This, and a mountaintop in the Bible is the place where spiritual things happen. It's on the mountaintop where Moses has given the law. It's on the mountaintop where the prophets of Baal are defeated by Elijah. It's on the mountaintop where Jesus is transfigured. And so he calls them to this mountain, and they once again must be thinking, okay, now this is it. This is the moment. This is when the kingdom comes. This is when Jesus takes his throne. But instead, this is when Jesus leaves. This is when Jesus says, all right, I'm done with my part, now you guys do your part. And so it makes sense that the words that we read at the beginning of this passage are the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Now I got to tell you, there are entire books written about verse 17. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Does that mean that some of the disciples worshiped him? And some of the disciples doubted him. It doesn't mean that all of the disciples worshipped him, and there were some other people there, maybe the 500 that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians, and those other people doubted. Surely the 11 disciples didn't doubt. 
Or does it mean, as the text seems to say most clearly, that they all worshipped him, and some of those who worshipped also doubted? And that's kind of hard for us to wrap our brains around because how can you actually worship him, believe that Jesus is God, believe that he's done all these things, seen him resurrected? How can you worship and doubt at the same time? That seems to not work. And yet the reality is that is the human experience, isn't it? Is that not what it feels like to follow after Jesus, to both worship him and at times have doubts and wrestle with fear, to have both faith and doubt held in tension at the same time? The Greek word that he uses there is distazo, and it literally means to be of two minds, to believe two things at the same time, and it only shows up one other time in the entire Bible. It shows up in the story where Peter walks on water. You remember that story? Jesus calls Peter to him. Peter gets out of the boat. He takes a couple of steps, and then he notices the storm around him, and he begins to sink. And Jesus reaches down and pulls him back out of the water, and he says, Peter, why do you have such little faith? Why do you doubt? Peter's doubt in that moment is not intellectual. It's not that Peter's going, well, you know, I've studied the Old Testament prophecies, and Jesus has fulfilled 18 of them, but there are still these 12 he hasn't, so I don't know, maybe he's not really who he says he is. Peter knows Jesus is walking on the water. He knows that he walked on the water. He believes in Jesus, but he also believes in the storm. He believes in the power and authority of Jesus, but he also believes in the power of the storm, and for a brief moment, he is of two minds. He wants to follow Jesus out onto the water, but he also doesn't want to die in the storm. And something like that is happening here for the disciples in Matthew 28. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the resurrected Lord, but they know the storm is coming. And if Jesus is going to leave them and they're going to have to do this by themselves, they're unsure. And so for a moment, they are of two minds. They both worship him and they doubt him. And is that not the experience of the Christian? That we want to follow Jesus, but we wrestle with these fears. We want to be obedient to him, but we have these doubts. We believe in him, and yet we struggle. Sometimes it looks a little something like this. Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You know whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know, and I'm always making decisions, but you make the perfect decisions, so you just sit right down and start making them. Wow, I'm honored. I mean... This feels great. Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. Oh, really? I thought your husband and you were going to pay off debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight, but I figured he doesn't have to know about it. So do you want to oh. go with me? No. <laughs> no? Why? Uh, what I mean is, uh, I don't know. Um, oh. So let me check my schedule, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Kat, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in it here. Look, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You wanted me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions? Right. So what's the problem? Uh, there's not a problem. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Really, please, here, sit down. As long as you're sure. I'm sure. Okay, okay. so let's start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. Right. So, okay, Jesus, you know what? I know what you're going to say, but um, see, you, do? you don't know the whole situation, you know? Oh, I, well, all I'm saying is that your attitude is a decision. Yes, of course, but I have a lot going on right now. <laughs> well, I know you're under a lot of pressure. Pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? This I, isn't working, Kat. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either me or it's you. Okay, I know. You know, I just, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but here, just take it. No, I'm not going to take it. You have to give it to me. Okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. And that struggle is the reality of what it looks like to follow after Jesus. To both believe and to doubt, to worship him. And in the, the depths of our soul, we have these moments where we're not sure if he's big enough to get us through the storm, big enough to overcome that obstacle. And so Jesus, knowing the doubts of his followers, and I think it's important to understand that what Jesus says next in verse 18 is a direct response to their fears and to their anxieties. He speaks this truth to help them make up their mind. He says, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. That's shorthand for saying any authority that can be given has been given to me. All of it. Not part of it, not a piece, not a little bit. The whole thing in heaven and on earth now belongs to me. And in many ways, Jesus here is referencing this passage in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7, we get this incredible vision of the future when God will establish his kingdom. And he talks about the one who will look like the Son of Man. And remember, throughout the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man has come to forgive sins. The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man has authority here. And so now that he's reached the end, he kindly fulfills this prophecy. This is Daniel 7, verse 13. I continued watching in the night visions, and I saw one who was like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days, that would be God the Father. And he was escorted before him. And he, the Son of Man, was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Jesus in this moment, as Matthew 28 is saying, that's me. I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to make my enemies into a footstool, and I will have a dominion that will stretch to the corners of the universe, and there will be no end to my reign. And if you read it, understanding where the disciples are coming from, you can hear the words of comfort. I know for a moment it seemed like the Jewish authorities were in charge. I know when they arrested me and they tried me, it looked like for a moment they had power and authority, but it was but a momentary illusion. For all authority has been given unto me. And I know for just a second there, it looked like Rome had authority and power. After all, Pilate's the one who convicted me, and it was Roman soldiers who beat me, and Roman soldiers who pierced my hands with nails. I know for just a second, it looked like they were in charge, but it was all an illusion because all authority on heaven and earth belongs unto me. In fact, even for a second there, maybe you thought death had some power. Maybe you thought Satan had some power. After all, maybe the serpent finally struck at the descendant of Eve and fell me and I was done. Maybe death was going to win. I know for just a moment it looked like someone else had authority, but it was all a fleeting illusion. For all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Don't believe it when it looks like other people have power. Don't believe it when it looks like other people are in charge. It all belongs to me. Reminds me of the story, a man by the name of Christian Hertner ran for mayor in Massachusetts way back in the 1950s. And this was before the days of big commercials and campaign trails. And, and so he was campaigning, you know, the old-fashioned way, going to little town hall meetings and showing up to church breakfast and going to Grange Halls. And he's working his way across the state one day, and he hasn't had a chance to eat. He had, a, had an event in the morning, and he's supposed to be on the other side of the state for an event that evening, hasn't had breakfast, isn't going to get to eat dinner. And as he's driving down this road, he sees a church having a, a chicken barbecue. And he thinks, well, I'm going to stop here at the church. I'm going to buy myself some barbecue chicken. I'll campaign a little bit. I'll shake some hands. So he goes up, and he buys a ticket for $5 or whatever, and he waits in line, and they put the green beans on, and they put the potato salad on, and he gets to the line, and the lady puts a, a piece of chicken on. And he says, ma'am, um, I, I haven't eaten all day. I'm, I'm really hungry. Is there any way I could get a second piece of chicken? And this little old church lady says, one ticket, one piece of chicken. Christian Hurtner says, ma'am, I don't know if you know who I am. I, my name's Governor Hurtner. I'm the governor of this entire state. Um, I, I think I got a little bit of authority here. I, I'd like two pieces of chicken, please. This little old church lady looks at him and goes, sir, I don't know if you know who I am. I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. And I said you get one piece. Move along. It's amazing how many times we think we have authority when we have none. It's amazing how many times people think they're in control or in charge when they're not. And we see that play out across our world. And those same words of comfort spoken to the disciples should bring comfort to you today. It would be easy to look at the current thing and think, man, our, our politicians and our political parties have all this power and authority. And if that guy wins, he's going to ruin everything. And if that guy wins, he's going to ruin everything. Listen, they're not in charge. It's but a momentary illusion. For all authority that can be given, every ounce of authority that can be given, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto Jesus. And it might look for a brief moment like they're in charge, but they're not. 
You might watch the news and see this extremist group or that extremist group, and they're rioting here, and they're protesting here, and they're fear-mongering, and those people, they're going to have too much influence and too much power. They have no power. It is but a light and momentary illusion. They might have power for a brief moment. They might be able to bring some harm, but all authority that can be given, real authority, real power, is unto the one who sits on the throne at the right hand of God, whose enemies have been made into his foot soul, whose dominion knows no end. All power, all authority belongs to Jesus, the risen Lord. And everything else is an illusion. And so we're going to use that as our launching point for worship this morning. We're going to sing these songs that declare the power and the name and the person of Jesus Christ. And we're going to praise him because sometimes we need to be reminded who's really in charge. Father, we come this morning to worship. We lift our voices to you. We sing these songs. And in doing so, we remind ourselves of the truth we already know. That all the power and authority belongs to you and you alone. Receive our worship in your son's name. Amen. Now the question that logically flows from what we have already read is if Jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, then why is our world such a mess, right? If he's really in charge, then why is there all the chaos and all the hurt and all the suffering? Why is the world so broken if Jesus is really in charge? And if that's your question, then what I say to you is, have you not ever had kids? Right? Because how many times have you sat down with your kid knowing full well that you are in charge and asked them to do something and they don't do it? How many times have you said, don't touch that, and as soon as you turn around, they touch that? And either with their words or their actions, they look at you and basically say, you're not the boss of me, even though you very much are the boss of them. Just because you have authority does not mean that everyone is going to submit to you. Now, we believe there's coming a day in the future, in the next lifetime, where everyone will submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. But in this world and in this time, he has given us free will. You can choose to defy or to submit to him, but your choice does not change the fact that he has ultimate authority. It only changes your consequences, right? When your four-year-old does what you tell them to do, they have wonderful days. They're happy, they get treats, they get to play. When your four-year-old says, you're not the boss of me, they don't have such wonderful days. There are consequences for choosing to defy your authority. Unless you think it's just kids, we're no better as adults. If you've ever been in a position of authority at work, you've had the person who, with their words or actions, says, you're not the boss of me. And you want to go, see that name underneath, that little title underneath my name, and it means I am the boss of you. But again, their choices don't change your authority, only their consequences. If they do what they're asked, if they do what they're told, if they submit to your authority, even when they don't understand, they get things like awards and promotions and pay raises and eventually retirement. If they choose not to submit to your authority, they get things like unemployment, right? Just because Jesus has authority doesn't mean that everyone does exactly what he wants to do. That choice is up to us. And while it's easy for us to look at the world and and criticize the world and say, I can't believe they're not more submissive, ultimately, the question is, are we submissive? Are we willing to submit to the authority of Jesus? Are we willing to do what he says, to believe the command that all authority is his and to follow even when we don't necessarily understand? And so because I am three on the inside, I brought another toy today. I like when I get to play with toys. This is a remote control car, right? The basic premise of a remote control car is this. The remote controls the car, okay? Clever, right? They named it well. But there are all sorts of things that can go wrong in that process. You can forget to change the batteries and have dead batteries in the car. You can forget to change the batteries in the remote and not have the remote properly connected. You can have the wrong control for the wrong car, and they're not attuned to the same frequency. There are all kinds of things that can happen so that the remote control car is not controlled by the remote. Do you know what we call a remote control car that is not controlled by its remote? Trash. Right? Useless. Best case scenario, it can sit on a shelf somewhere and look pretty and collect dust, but it has no real purpose. See, the purpose of a remote control car is to be properly attuned to its remote 
and to go where you want it to go, when you want it to go there. We're going to go see Derek. Hi, Derek. Oh, he's hiding. He can do little tricks. It'll spin in circles for you. And the proper remote control car listens when you send it somewhere. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are you properly attuned to your master? Are you properly attuned to your master? Because here's what Jesus is going to say next in the Great Commission. He's going to say, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always until the end of the age. And if you really believe that Jesus has all authority, then following the second part of that commandment should come naturally. If you really believe that Jesus is in charge, then there should be within you a deep desire to go into the world and make disciples, to share what you have found, to pour into other people, to lead others to Christ, to baptize them, to teach them all that Jesus has commanded, and to help them become disciple makers too. You know what we call a Christian who's not properly attuned to their master? I won't use the word trash, but I'll use the word useless. Someone who just sits on a shelf and looks pretty, but doesn't actually do what their master tells them to do. I always thought I had a penchant for bluntness, but I've got nothing on some of the old preachers. You read some of the writings of some of these old guys, most famously for today, if you know the name Charles Spurgeon. Now, Charles Spurgeon was a famous preacher in England, part of the Great Awakening there, ministered to hundreds and thousands of people, wrote countless devotionals. Here are his words. He says, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Either you believe what we just sang, that all power belongs to the name of Jesus, that his name can save people, that his name is a strong and mighty tower, and you go into the world to do what he told you to do. I'm going to go make disciples. Or you don't really believe in his authority. You don't really believe that he's Lord of everything. You're pushing him off the stool. Every Christian is either a missionary. That doesn't mean you're moving to Guatemala or you're moving to Colombia. It means that you're going to go into the world wherever you're going and you're going to make disciples. You're going to share the name of Jesus. You're going to share your faith. You're going to bring light into the world. Much of what we believe as a church is we talk about our core principles that we're going to love God, we're going to be light, and we're going to grow disciples comes from this passage. That if we love God, we're going to take his light to people who desperately need it, and we're going to help them grow into faithful followers of Jesus. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Which one are you? We're going to sing a song that prepares us for communion, but also serves as our invitation time. And I just want to challenge you. Do you believe in the power and authority of Jesus? Do you want to be the kind of person who makes disciples? That's what we're going to talk about for the next three weeks. What it means to be a missionary, to make disciples, to take what we have found in Christ and share with those around us. Do you believe in that? Or do you just kind of come to church because it's what we do? Are you tuned in to the Jesus who controls you? You're going to let him sit on the stool. Is he going to have authority? Are you going to submit to it or not? Every Christian is a missionary or an apostle. So as we sing this song about the power of Jesus, about the power of the cross, might you ask that question, which one am I? And what would it look like for me to become a missionary, to share the power of the cross with the people around me, to share and proclaim that truth? Father, we repent of the times that we are simply not in tune with you. It's amazing how easy it is for us to get caught doing things our own way, to forget what you've called us to be. We struggle with pride. We struggle with temptation. We struggle with listening to the wrong voices. 
Father, may you use this moment to call us back to you. To remind us that the cross is what gives us life. The cross is what gives us meaning. And our life should be about that. Father, may this serve as a time of repentance as we choose to proclaim your power and the life we have because of it. In your son's name, amen.